Hey everybody, it's Lon Seib and it's time once again for your weekly wrap up and we've got a whole bunch of stuff to talk about today including all of the topics that you see here on screen. We've got a full video index down below in the video description so let's get to it. Now before we begin I want to thank our newest supporters here on the channel. They include Star Trekker and Thomas Ruffley who joined via the YouTube membership program. We also have Matt Rune, who signed up on Patreon. I want to thank them for their support. And we had a bunch of super chatters this week during a couple of our live streams that we've been simulcasting here and on Amazon. They include Thomas Ruffley, who also gave via the super chat, Netlux TV, Zam, Gameplay, Gameplay and Talk, and Mark Bollinger. I want to thank everyone for their support of the channel this week, along with everyone who's been contributing on an ongoing basis too, and all of you who watch on a regular basis because all of those things equal channel growth. So let's take a look now at the Week in Review. On the Extras channel, we unbox the DJI Mavic Mini drone that I hope to play with a little bit later this week. Uh, stay tuned for that. We might live stream my evaluation process with that one. Uh, we had three live streams this week, speaking of. Uh, on my live stream feed that you can see here on screen. These are going to be simulcast on Amazon as well. Uh, so if you want to watch me doing my evaluation process, you can do that now. I'm going to pop on randomly at various times throughout the week, and you can uh, set the notification bell and get notified when I do pop up. They're lots of fun, and it's been great to get a lot of you in there uh, providing your feedback in real time. That's been a lot of fun for me. Uh, and then I did a bunch of stuff on the main channel, including a look at the new Plex free TV and movie service that launched this week. That one got a lot of views, as you can see. Uh, we also took a look at the Oculus Quest again because it now works with the PC. And we investigated all of that in that follow-up video. That one's actually doing better than I thought. And what's interesting, you'll hear me talk about this more later on in the video today, uh, the Oculus Quest is doing very well, and that is indicated in the amount of traffic I get whenever I talk about it here on the channel as well. It's by far the most watched VR product that I have looked at, and I've looked at a lot, and I think that is an indicator that there is some uh, consumer interest out there for this thing. And then, of course, we had my top products of 2019. Usually every December, I take a look at everything I've looked at since last December, and tell you which of those things I thought rose to the top. And we had a good number of things this year. We're going to talk more about my two top, top picks a little bit later in the wrap-up. And now it's time for some things in the news that caught my eye. And here in the U.S., of course, Toys R Us went out of business, but now they're coming back if you live in Texas or New Jersey. And we've got a few images here of the new New Jersey Toys R Us store. This is opening up in a mall, so it's a much smaller space than they had with their very large big box stores. And what they're doing is becoming more of a destination as opposed to just being a big retailer. Uh, what they've got here are arrangements with a number of major toy brands who rent out a particular portion of the store and they put all of their latest wares out for the kids to get hands-on playtime with. Uh, this was one of the chief concerns that the toy industry had when Toys R Us went out of business because a lot of kids would go to Toys R Us to see what the toys were all about and it was funny because Toys R Us kind of treated that as a secondary activity second to sales, but it looks like uh, this model really is probably the one they should have adopted before they went out of business. And it appears as though Lego and Paw Patrol and a few of the other major uh, toy brands have bought into this concept. Now, there is some concern about this new layout uh, because part of what they're doing is tracking the activities of customers in the store, according to CNBC. Uh, the company is being a little vague about exactly what they are tracking. It looks as though uh, they're looking at where people are kind of gravitating to in the store. And I'm guessing the data that they're collecting from people playing with toys in the store will be sent back to the manufacturers as part of whatever deal they've worked out. As we all know, data is sometimes more valuable than actual sales are, and clearly that's part of the strategy here. But it's good to see the brand back. It's good to see them approaching this, not just as any other normal retailer, but looking at what retail needs to be in the 21st century, which is a hands-on experience. They're going to do things like what the Apple Store does with events and little seminars and that sort of thing for the kids to join in on. So I think it's going to work, um, but it's going to be a while before this all gets out across the country. And of course, 
uh, this is going to not be the Toys R Us that you remembered from your youth, but I think those days are long gone. And it's unfortunate that the company couldn't pivot uh, quick enough to adapt to this new strategy in retail, but it looks like now they're picking up the pieces. And at the moment, these stores are in Paramus, New Jersey and Houston, Texas at uh, some popular shopping malls there. So we'll see where these end up spreading out to throughout the year. Now, I wanted to share something with you that I discovered on Google search the other day that I think might be of value to other YouTube creators. I was looking up a video for my video of the year video, and when I was doing the search for it, uh, look what popped up in Google search on my mobile phone. It actually integrated my video index into the result, and if you are searching for something, uh, you can actually jump to the right spot right from a Google search. So if you are putting videos on YouTube, I would strongly suggest to start putting indexes to your video in the description because this is the kind of stuff that will result, I think, in more traffic to your channel. It takes a little bit of time to do on the front end, but the payoffs here are pretty significant, especially if you've got that index integrated right into the Google search result, which it looks like uh, Google is now doing. Now, a lot of you have been asking me to bring back my Didn't Make the Cut series of videos, and this was something that I know a few of you subscribers were really into, but a lot of the broader audience was not. And what I was doing in these videos was taking two or three products that I thought were pretty bad and doing a video about why I thought that way. Now, this is not me trashing the product. I was trying to come up with some really good reasons as to why you shouldn't buy it. Uh, but for whatever reason, uh, that style of video just didn't work and I wasn't getting the traffic that would warrant that much investment of my time. And I think what happened is a lot of people just don't want to watch a video about how bad something is. They want to see something good and uh, that's where we've kind of pivoted to. And I do, of course, have critical evaluations of products in my regular reviews. But typically, if I'm doing a product review, it's going to have a value to some portion of the market segment. And if there are portions that the product is not good for, we certainly talk about that. But I was thinking about this the other day, and you know what? I think the wrap-up might be a good place to bring this segment back. And then we can pull this out and throw it up on the Snippets channel and get some search traffic out of it. So that's what we're going to experiment with here uh, rolling forward. And I would love to hear your thoughts on that because I am down here shooting the video anyhow and it's a good new segment we can put in to kind of freshen up this show a bit. So this week's product that didn't make the cut is the Nebula Soundbar with integrated Amazon Fire TV. I paid for this with my own funds. It cost about $229. And I thought this might be a good general consumer soundbar because I was really fond of the one that Roku put out uh, just a few weeks ago that we looked at here on the channel. That one was very well integrated. They had a subwoofer option you could add onto it. It wasn't all that expensive and I found it to be very easy to use for the consumer. Uh, this one is the opposite. Now what it does do well is integrate the Fire TV into it. Uh, so when you turn it on, it will default into that mode. It supports 4K TVs. It supports HDR, both HDR10 and Dolby Vision. It'll support 60 Hertz. Uh, it does not have Ethernet on board, but it does support AC Wi-Fi. I think it lines up with the Amazon Fire TV Stick 4K. Uh, so all that is sort of good. But the bad is a much longer list of issues. And the first is the audio quality. Now this is being sold as a 2.1 soundbar, which is stereo plus the 0.1, which is supposed to be a subwoofer. And it says it has a subwoofer integrated, but the bass is almost non-existent. It sounds uh, quite flat, doesn't have a lot of boom to it. And although the soundbar is loud and kind of crisp, like most soundbars are given how they're designed, uh, it just doesn't sound that great with feature films. And I was hoping for a little bit more boom out of this, again, given that this is a device that supposedly has a subwoofer built into it. So just on audio quality alone, it lost me right there. The Roku had a much better range of sound, even without the optional subwoofer that you can get with it. So that was a big strike against it right out of the gate. Uh, the other thing that really got me with this is that it's very difficult to switch between modes for the general consumer. So here's the remote. It looks a lot like the remotes you see on other Fire TV devices with the uh, buttons down here that all these services paid to be on. And to switch out of Fire TV mode and over to maybe HDMI ARC, for example, you've got to hit this gear icon. And when you do that, you're going to see this thing start to blink. And you have to then 
hit to the right here to switch between modes. So you can see we're going from Fire TV to Bluetooth to ARC and back again. Uh, but if you forget that combination uh, and you hit up instead, you start going into all of the different audio adjustments. So I felt that was really clumsy, especially given that uh, people are going to want to switch modes on the soundbar quite frequently, especially if they have other devices plugged into it. Now, it does support analog inputs on it, so you can plug in your CD player or whatever. Uh, it also has optical inputs and, of course, the HDMI ARC support, which is the audio return channel. Now, on the Roku soundbar, ARC was automatic. I didn't have to switch into anything to get audio coming out of the television. So, for example, if I was playing a video game on a game console, that audio would automatically come out of the soundbar, no futzing around, it would just work. Here, you've actually got to switch it into that mode every time, uh, which was quite aggravating, especially because the ARC didn't work at all on my Samsung TV. And on my LG OLED upstairs, I had to put it into Fire TV mode first and then switch it over to ARC for it to pick it up for that device. So it really wasn't seamless, and I was surprised by how hard it was just to get some basic functions working with it. Now, it does come with a voice remote, so that was good. The problem, though, is that it's not automatically paired with the Fire TV. Uh, so when you first turn it on, it's IR only, and to get the voice function working, you have to manually pair it in Fire TV mode. At least that was my experience. It didn't prompt me to get the remote paired up initially. On top of that, the only time the voice commands work is when you're in Fire TV mode. So if you're in ARC mode and issue a voice command, uh, you would think that perhaps it would respond to that. So if I wanted to, for example, maybe play uh, something on Netflix, and if I issued that command while in ARC mode, nothing would happen. Uh, and of course, when you look at the Fire TV official devices, the Fire TV Cube would automatically go out and switch into the right inputs and get you all back up and running. Not on this one. You've got to just uh, switch it back to Fire TV mode and then issue the voice command to get everything up and running. So it just feels clumsy and disconnected and not all that integrated. It doesn't sound all that great. It's a little bit expensive for what it is, and I think they need to go back to the drawing board on this one, or perhaps maybe Amazon can make their own and do a better job of this, because we've seen them doing some really nice speakers and some really nice Fire TV devices, and having Amazon make one I think would be much better than what they licensed here, and I'm having a hard time recommending this one to anyone, especially general consumers who are buying one of these things for simplicity. This thing is anything but. So let me know down below what you think of Didn't Make the Cut being part of the wrap-up. We're not going to do it every week, but whenever I've got something to talk about, uh, we'll likely integrate it somewhere into the lineup here on the wrap-up show. But I do want to get your feedback on that first before we make that part of our semi-regular programming here. So let me know down in the comment section below. And now it's time for a Q&A from you, the viewers. And you'll recall last week I was asking you all about how we test Linux on our computers that we review here on the channel. And what I was asking was whether or not it was a good idea to test things based on a live boot of Ubuntu versus actually installing the operating system and using that as our basis of testing. And I should tell you that my primary goal in testing Linux on these computer reviews is not to benchmark anything, but just look at whether or not the hardware can be detected without a lot of aggravation. Uh, so if somebody who was more of a passive user wanted to try out Linux, uh, what the experience might be insofar as getting the Wi-Fi and the video and the audio all working properly. And that's largely been my approach to things. And what I asked last week was whether or not hardware detection is different on a live boot versus an install. And from what I heard from a number of you, including uh, Paolo and Jacob here, is that the hardware detection should be the same whether we do a live boot or a full-on install. Now, I will say when we do something more involved with Linux, like a Plex server kind of thing, uh, we do a full Ubuntu install versus the live boot because, of course, that might have a performance difference. But I think for hardware detection, the live boot is fine, and I'm going to stick with that unless anyone's got some serious objections about that from a hardware detection standpoint. Again, in our reviews, we primarily look at compatibility, not performance on Linux, 
And I would like to just make sure I am on the right track with that to make sure we're properly representing compatibility to viewers. So let me know if we're on the right track here down in the comments below. Now, yesterday, of course, I posted a video with my top products of 2019. Uh, but Darren Buss here was asking which of them was my absolute favorite. And I have to say, out of everything I've looked at, uh, both in that video and all the other products we reviewed this year, the Oculus Quest is the top product of the year. And the reason is, is that it is a transformative product, it's innovative, it's consumer friendly, it's reasonably priced, it's two products in one now that it works with the PC as well as on its own. And I think from the standpoint of something new and different and cool and functional, that one certainly uh, takes the nod for the product of the year. I've been doing this now for about six or seven years, and it just, you know, it's getting to the point where nothing is new and innovative anymore. Everything is just kind of a slight variation of what we saw before. And some of those variations can be nice improvements, but really there's not been a lot of stuff that's been crazy transformative lately. And the Quest really is something that uh, hits that for me, and I think that's why it is my top product of the year, at least from what I have looked at. Uh, also on the list, though, is the Mr. Project, and I think that's something, of course, that's not a general consumer device, but for those of us uh, nerds of a certain age, uh, it is a great way to re-experience and essentially recreate a lot of the old hardware that uh, we've got on my uh, shelves behind me here as a shrine because it is just fantastic what uh, the community is doing to replicate some of this old stuff properly and accurately. And it's also been exciting just to see uh, just how quickly all of this has come together and how it's becoming a real focus point for uh, a lot of folks who are into the retro computing and retro gaming communities. And as such, I think that uh, Mr. is really a great gift if you uh, have someone in your life that you know is into this kind of stuff. And what's great about the Mr. is that it just doesn't work when you turn it on. You got to piece things together. You got to install software. There's always a lot of tinkering going on with it. And that really makes for a uh, very good product for people like us. But for the rest of the world, I think the Oculus Quest really is something that takes away all the complexity that VR once had and puts it into something that is really a turnkey plug and play out of the box solution. And that's why it is my top product of the year. And related to that, uh, CF542 posted this on my recent video of the Oculus Quest saying that VR headsets are going to go the way of 3D TVs. Neat idea, but most people don't want to wear things on their heads in the long run. And I would certainly agree with him from the standpoint of everyday devices. You know, Google attempted the Google Glass experiment, uh, which was a cool idea, but I think a lot of folks did not like the idea of wearing this contraption on their head and walking around in public. I sure didn't want to do that. Uh, but I think VR is a little different in that it is a short duration wearable. Uh, it's something that brings an experience to you when you want to play a game or do something uh, for entertainment purposes and not so much for everyday usage. And I think there's probably a little bit more life to this. And what I think has been happening with VR, and I've talked about this before, is that PC VR is too complicated for consumers. Consumers want an appliance that they can take out of the box and use like a smartphone. If you look across the entire marketplace now, even PCs are getting to the point where you take them out, you turn them on, and you're off and running. Uh, PC VR required the right kind of PC with the right kind of hardware, with all the software working properly, all the sensors and everything set up in the right positions, and it wasn't easy for consumers to just pick up and play. And that's where I think the Oculus Quest is a bit different when it comes to VR devices. And there's some indication here that we're seeing things take off a bit. Um, of course, Facebook reported that their sales are pretty strong on this. They're not selling millions of units, but I think the sales have met whatever expectations they set for it. Uh, Facebook, of course, owns Oculus. Uh, there was actually an impact on their profits in a good way. Uh, so their non-advertising revenue, they say, jumped $269 million in the first quarter. A bulk of that, or a big chunk of that, uh, due to the sale of the Quest and probably the software that they're selling with it. And speaking of software, uh, Gamma Sutra here has something that a few other news outlets reported on, which is that 20% of the Oculus' store 100 million in lifetime sales came from the Quest. And remember, the Quest only came out in May. Uh, so they're finally moving software here, and that's going to attract more developers. Uh, Facebook's going to be able to go to these developers, maybe pay them a little bit and say, hey, we're going to get you some sales here. 
uh, if you develop on the Quest platform. And I think you're going to see more and more software start on the Quest and then make its way out to the other platforms if it's successful there, because there appears to be uh, some movement of hardware and software that we have not been seeing in the couple of years now that VR headsets have been on the market. So we're going to keep an eye on this. I wouldn't be surprised to see Facebook come up with a more powerful Quest maybe this year or next year uh, to see what happens. But I do agree it's not going to uh, be as fast as everyone thought it was going to be when this technology was first introduced. But I'm just seeing patterns in my, my video traffic. Uh, we're seeing some sales data here to suggest that the Quest is probably what consumers have been looking for. And as the horsepower increases and the optics get better, I think this is where we're going to go with these standalone devices that may not be as powerful as your PC, but are a lot easier to use. And in our Q&A for you this week, I would love to hear from you as to what makes a good live stream. Is it something where you've got a really good set of content coming at you, where there's a plan and a execution of that plan and a well-produced series of events that go on, or do you just prefer the ability to interact with your favorite content creators in a less organized way? I just love to hear some of your feedback on this because I'm trying to figure out if we really want to go the route of doing these really topical and well-produced live streams or kind of make them more of a random Q&A with some unboxings and some other things going on. I've been looking at my statistics on both formats and it looks like the more random stuff is winning out but I'd love to hear from you what uh, you think works best for a live stream. Let me know down in the comments below. And our pick of the week this week is another scam baiting channel. Uh, this one is Kit Boga and like the others he wastes the time of these overseas scam call centers so that they don't go out and steal money from other people. It's a great window as to how all of these things operate. In the course of his scam baiting, he will mute his mic and explain to people what's going on so they can help others avoid these uh, particular schemes. Uh, but he does it in a very entertaining way. He's got all these cool filters on his microphone. Um, he has one that makes him sound like a 90-year-old woman, and it's just so well done. Uh, that you'll spend hours going through his content if you haven't seen it already. So check out Kit Boga at the link you see on screen. So this week we have a whole bunch of stuff coming in. I don't know how I'm going to get to it all, to be quite honest with you. Uh, tomorrow I am finally getting in the new ATEM Mini. Uh, this is a video switcher that sells, I think, for under $300.00. And it also is a live streaming device. So it's kind of a video capture device, a streaming device, and a switcher all in one for a very reasonable price tag. It has four video inputs. It supports some degree of picture in picture. I'm very excited to get this in. And I know a lot of you have been eager for me to check it out. Uh, there's some real utility for this here on my channel as well. So this is coming in on Tuesday, and as soon as it comes in, we'll start playing with it. It's definitely going to be a priority item for the week. I also hope to get to the Lenovo Smart Display, which is still in the box or just out of the box and hasn't been hooked up yet, but I do want to take a look at it and see how it compares to the Google offering. Uh, we're going to try to do something with the Mavic Mini probably as a live stream first, followed by a review. I want to test some of its autonomous flight functions and get some footage of that, which will uh, stream out if the weather improves. It's raining today. It's probably going to rain tomorrow. And then Wednesday, we're getting snow. So I'm not too hopeful we're going to have good weather for this thing. So uh, once we get a good weather day, that's not too windy, uh, we will give it a shot and see how it works. And then I think also later this week, probably towards the end of the week, my new gaming PC is coming in. So we're going to be uh, obviously taking a look at that, which is the uh, Lenovo Y740 15-inch with a 2080 inside. So I'm very eager to get at that one. Uh, we also, of course, have the new uh, Amazon Echo Studio that we unboxed yesterday, a couple other things from Lenovo accessories to look at. So there's just a ton that is going to be on here and on the Extras channel. I'm just going to try to get as much up as I can uh, as we are certainly in the thick of the holiday shopping season. And I still have these SSDs I've got to review, which I actually did review and shot. I just haven't had a good spot to uh, shuffle this video into the mix for use of scribers. Uh, this, of course, is the Tuft Tan uh, Nano uh, from CalDigit. The review is up on Amazon, so if you go to the listing on Amazon, you will see my review there, and we'll get it up here on the main channel once we find a good spot to slot it into. I try not to overload subscribers with too much content, 
Um, so if I see a video doing well, I don't like to kill its momentum by uploading another one too soon. So that's why you haven't seen that one yet. But it's a decent little SSD, which we'll talk about a little later in the week. Now, if you want to support the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv slash support and make a monthly or a one-time contribution. We also support the YouTube membership program, which a lot of you have been using. So you can uh, become a subscriber of the channel right through the YouTube interface. And we've got two different tiers available. And they put a pretty cool badge next to your name when you leave comments or chat during live streams. So that's another option for you there. We have our ongoing relationship with Plex. So if you sign up for a free Plex account to get those free TV and movies, uh, we get a small commission for that. And you don't even have to give them your credit card. So that's a great way to help the channel. Uh, we also have the Plex Pass link. If you want to sign up for that Plex Pass, uh, you can do that there. And then you can gift a Plex Pass to someone else for the holidays uh, with that link that you see at the lower section there. Now, you can follow me on my other channels, including the Extras channel for unboxings, mini reviews, and supplementary content. We have my podcast feed at lon.tv slash podcast, where we upload an audio version of this show every week, along with some radio interviews that I do from time to time. We have my Snippets channel at lon.tv slash snippets for search-friendly bite-sized pieces of this show that we re-upload throughout the week. Uh, we also have my live streams at lon.tv slash live streams, all archived for you. So you can watch me tinker with stuff for tens of hours if you want. And then we have the Amazon shop at lon.tv slash Amazon shop, where you can follow me now and see when I go live along with uh, seeing some of the written reviews that I do on the Amazon platform. So check that out when you get a chance. Now, if you want to get notified when I upload or go live or do anything else, you can click on the notification bell and you will get notified when we do go live there. So definitely have at that. And we have a number of ways you can engage with the channel, including my email list, my Facebook page. Uh, we got the Facebook group, which is, I think, almost at 800 members now. It's very close to that number, which is great. A lot of great interactivity, a lot of great ideas for this show come out of the Facebook group. So please uh, join that if you haven't already. And then we have the store at lon.tv store, where you can find previously reviewed items uh, that I am getting rid of. And you can get an alert every time I add something to the store at lon.tv slash store alert. Uh, so definitely do that if you want to get a good deal on something. I've got uh, two laptops in there right now, a Dell XPS 15 and that Dell Alienware gaming laptop I talked about last week. We're going to be clearing out some extra stuff here to get uh, room for that new computer to come in. So if you're looking for something, take a look or sign up for the email alert and we'll send you an email every time we add something to the store. And that is going to do it for this week's weekly wrap up. I want to thank you all for your continued viewership and comments. Keep all that stuff coming. It helps guide me as we continue posting new content for all of you. And until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters, the Four Guys with Quarters podcast, Chris Allegretta, Tom Albrecht, Brian Parker, and Kalyan Kumar. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.